wherever or whenever. His big victories. You could bet it all on me. Anything that I do, I do it B I G. Shot callers, so they call on me. If my dogs don't eat, then they fall on me. It's the ice on the wrist for me. I'm living life like it's meant to be. Live every day, shit, everything big, big crib, big bands, nigga. It's a big victory. Welcome to another edition of the Big Victories Podcast. Jeremy St. Louis alongside Big Vic. And we have State Senator Travaris McCurdy here with us as well, joining us today to talk on the program. And I'm wearing a Philadelphia Eagles jersey because... You're not an Eagle fan? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be made apparent soon. We're going to have somebody popping on with us who, who, uh, who is... Uh, a lot of people will know. But um, for now, I'm just a guy in an Eagles jersey talking to a Florida State Senator alongside uh vic and so uh travara said so thank you very much for joining us today uh how are you i'm well gentlemen thank you one one quick correction i well i do appreciate the uh, the upgrade and the promotion i am uh, a state representative state I'm representative okay yes. you know we see your future so you know what i mean we just, <laughs> <laughs> i told you i appreciate the promotion i respect it so. well let, let's uh let's get into the conversation um you know, about there's a number of topics that we want to obviously discuss with you, but I guess top of mind is is the fact that the state, the governor seems to be content on on going to war with Disney. And it's obviously something that's in the news. It's very topical here in the state of Florida. It's topical elsewhere, too, because Disney is a worldwide brand. But I guess give me start by giving us your kind of take on how things are kind of playing. You're in Orlando, so kind of give us a take on how things are kind of playing out. Correct. Um, again, uh, State Representative Travis McCurdy, I represent House System 46 in the Florida Legislature, which uh, consists of parts of West Orange County here in the city of Orlando. And uh, Disney is, while it's not in my district directly, um, it's just a rock and a skip away um, uh, from, from where I am. So uh, me, I, I grew up here in my district where I, where, I, where I serve. So Disney has been a part of my life all 38 years Um so I, I really um, have a, a, an affinity, but a, a, a very unique perspective, not just being a member of the legislature, but being a, part, a member of the uh, Central Florida delegation. And folks are just really confused right now because this is just retribution um, from the governor uh, using the executive branch to uh, to punish Disney uh, on their stance on the don't say gay bill and their refusal to uh, walk it back. So this is really is actually is really dangerous. Um, I, I just want to let people know that's listening. We were uh, expecting a special session. It was called. Governor did a proclamation. We actually sent letters to the Secretary of State to ask the governor to expand the scope of the call to not just include uh, the congressional redistricting, which was the only, the only topic um, up for discussion. That was uh, eventually defeated because none of my Republican colleagues, um, after the legislature was polled, um, none of my Republican colleagues thought it was important enough for us to include uh, property insurance and the, uh, the spike in um, home um, and, and the cost of rent here, to, here and throughout the state of Florida. So that was defeated. But as I was driving my rental car from Orlando <laughs> on 75 and I-10, the governor expanded the call to include uh, the Reedy Creek uh, dissolution, which was the Disney um, issue. And this was merely um, we were do the gavel in at 12 o'clock noon. Uh, and this was done about nine o'clock that morning. So merely hours before staff had no time to analyze uh, the costs on uh, ramifications that this would call uh, uh, an impose on uh, surrounding municipalities by like Orange County, by like Osceola County. So even Orange County was caught off guard. The lobbyists for Orange County uh, reached out to the Central uh, for the delegation members like um, we got the news the same time you all did. Um, we're going, we're <laughs> running numbers. We'll get more information. We heard, I heard from them. That was about 1130 on Tuesday, right before we gaveled in. And I haven't really heard anything from um, my, my local county government uh, yet, because I mean, it's still in this infancy. We're trying to figure out it's, 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 it's unfortunate. I'm a father of a four year old uh, child. So I know kids throw uh, fits and tantrums, but it's unfortunate that we have to, um, play nice and walk on thin ice with our governor because he throws fits and tantrums. Nobody wants to say the wrong <laughs> thing in the media, you know, for, you know, further uh, retribution. Very um, well. Also, Sorry, go yeah. ahead. No, I just also want to add this last piece because while we were there for the congressional uh, redistricting, 
I also feel that this was a attack on um, two members here in my local community, two local leaders who happen to be husband and wife, um, and our county mayor, Jerry Demings, and his wife, Congresswoman Val Demings. The reason I say that it's an attack on them, our county mayor, uh, Jerry Demings, was very vocal and outspoken against the governor um, with all the COVID mandates um, that the governor was trying to withheld, uh, withhold him uh, from, from doing here in this local government and, and not uh, respecting home rule. So now with the uh, potential dissolution of uh, Reedy Creek, that tax, um, that, that million dollar debt that they have is going to be accrued by somebody, right? So it's obviously got to be the surrounding counties, which are Orange and Osceola. If that is to happen, residents are not going to be looking at the governor and blaming him for the taxes going up. They're going to be looking at the county mayor for the taxes going up. And then he took away uh, Congresswoman Val Demings, uh, her, her minority uh, represented congressional seat. If in, uh, in the event that she was, um, wasn't was successful for her U.S. Senate bid and had to, you know, wanted to come back to try to run, that, that seat no longer uh, exists as a minority uh, protected uh, wow. seat in Congress. What, you, what was the reason you think that brought on? I know you got into for him just out the blue started doing this. You think it actually came on from some personal issue or something that he has like, because, you know, for an average voter or somebody who's outside your county or who's outside of Florida, Disney means a lot to us because that's a vacation spot. You know what I mean? It's people who can't go to the Caribbean, take the kids to Disney. Right. Who can't go to Europe, take the kids to Disney. Not just a vacation spot, man. It's one of the largest employers in the state. I know Disney's not in my district, but there are so many people. Like, you can take a bus from my district and uh, go if you work at if you work at Disney. That's how close that's how close in, in geographical location we are. But it's it employs so many people here in our state. People who don't necessarily go to college, have degrees, or further their education. Disney gives you an opportunity to provide for your family, right? Um, but uh, aside from that, it's, it's just it's sending a dangerous message um, that you uh, one we can't have freedom of speech. So. You're telling companies and corporations that they can't um, uh, share uh, or express the way that they feel, whether the legislation is good or bad for the people that uh, that work for them. Um, and they're the re reflection of these people. So I'm I'm actually happy to hear that companies as big as Disney with so much influence are not afraid to speak up against um, bigotry and, and um, stand up for marginalized groups. Um, and this is what the governor, those are groups that he attacks at, at every cost. When you talk about the CRT bans, education um, attacks, when you think about this 15 week abortion ban, he's always attacking marginalized groups. Um, and it's always on, on the backs of these people. So um, I think it's sending a, a, a bad message. I hope people are paying attention. One of the reasons uh, why me and my colleague uh, decided to disrupt that process last week, because we felt like a lot of this stuff is being done in the dark. And just being done just in the middle of the night and people aren't paying attention. So we want to turn the lights on um, to what's going on in Tallahassee. We were fortunate enough a couple of weeks ago to have gubernatorial candidate uh, Annette Tadeo on with us to talk about uh, a number of issues related to Florida. Obviously, the Disney thing had not happened, but we did talk about Don't Say Gay and kind of where that kind of lies, depending on how things go in the governor's race. But I guess one of the things, uh, Travaris, that I wanted to ask you is that for someone that maybe doesn't necessarily have an understanding. And I know you said you're still crunch you guys are still crunching the numbers trying to figure out what is the impact at the outset right now on Joe Public, the person that doesn't necessarily understand what exactly is going on, but they will understand when it starts to hit their bottom line. What is the implication right now in terms of how it will affect Joe Public? Right now, if you live in the surrounding uh, areas to Disney, surrounding counties in Orange and Osceola County specifically, your taxes have the potential to increase drastically because we are going to now be burdened with debt that we did not accrue because the government wants to shut down a government. Uh, Disney for 55 years has been governing themselves, providing their own fire, providing their own services. And now with the dissolution, if you shut that down, it has to be provided by someone. So Orange County, Osceola County, we got to figure it out because we've never had anything like this. Not even a discussion happened before. And so for this, all of a sudden overnight, um, uh, this issue to come is, is very alarming and it's very scary, especially because our county, um, uh, our county mayor and our county commissioners last night 
just approved. Thank God they approved for it to be on the ballot because they could have just pushed it through um, on, on the commission, on the council. But it's going to be on this November ballot for a 1% sales um, tax increase for transportation and road and other infrastructure projects. So now it puts the, the county government in the bind because how can you propose a 1% sale, in, uh, sale tax increase with this now new um, bill lingering over our head now, seemingly? So um, things are... Uh, you think the cost of gas is high, the cost of groceries are, are, are high, the cost of rent is increasing. Unfortunately, there could be potential more um, increases uh, to your to your um, expenses because of, of a, a, a governor who wants to fight with a mouse instead of help you protect and keep your house. So, uh, Hugh, by the way, Hugh Douglas has popped on. That's uh, one of our uh, guests today as well. Hugh, want to just welcome you. We're just having a conversation here with a state representative, uh, Travars McCurdy, uh, about the situation with uh, Disney and uh, the obviously the Governor Ron DeSantis and kind of his stance against Disney. Uh, Travars, one of the things I wanted to just also ask you about is what does it say to you and how do you communicate it to your constituents that this is not a fight that the county was interested in having. You said nobody has come and said, hey, uh, Disney, uh, they're a problem. But all of a sudden, the governor has said, hey, Disney's a problem. So how do you make sure that you're communicating that properly to the constituents? Right. Um, I, think, I, I think it's very clear. I think the governor has made it very clear that this is something that he pulled out of, um, you know, from, from his bed of, of issues. Um, this is a personal dispute that he's had, that he has. And also in Tallahassee, I'm very vocal. I'm a very vocal advocate. Work with the League of Cities uh, to protect what we call home rule here in the state of Florida. That gives the counties and uh, municipalities the, the, the right to to govern themselves, because what you don't want to see is state uh, coming in to infiltrate any of these 67 counties to tell them what's best for them. Because that's why we elect local uh, government and local leaders to to best uh, serve their constituents um, on, on the local level. So this was not anything. Um, but this is a pattern with the governor. Just like this, uh, these election bills last year, he had SB 90. This year, he created a, a election police force um, that he oversees. Um, and, and, and the thing about this, not one supervisor of election from any of the 67 counties asked for any of this. So the governor, he doesn't look for uh, best practices. He doesn't look to bring people to the table. He doesn't look to uh, converse with experts. He just looks to um, um, uh, uh, attain to his base, um, you know, and, and just throw red meat. And this is um, all because of his ambition and his desire to run for president in two years. Yeah, he's a, that's a well-known fact that he's probably going to be running for president. I just can't see it. I mean, I can see him running for president, but to, you know, to be fair, I just can't. I, I can't see it. Uh, I can't see him getting elected as president. But I mean, who knows? We also didn't think Donald Trump would be president, but uh, here we are. Um, okay, so when it comes to when it comes to how things are kind of laid out right now, I mean, it seems to me like taking on a company like Disney. With all the people that they employ, with all the benefits that come with having Disney in your state, this seems to me like a fool's errand by the governor and a mistake to take on Disney. I mean, I would agree. Um, but I think another one of the other larger employers is Publix. Um, Publix is lock and step with the governor. So he really just is using his bully pulpit um, this face, he's one of the most, unfortunately, one of the most popular governors in the country. And he and the governor of Texas, they're just trying to outdo each other and see who can be the nastiest. Um, and he's, wow. using Florida, he's using Florida as a guinea pig, man. Yeah. He's really using Florida as a guinea pig. And this is, these are what he's doing on the state level. If he were to become, uh, be, be, get elected president, these are the type of things that he would try to do uh, nationwide. So this is, um, you see, it, it, you know, with the uh, data privacy bills, how he's uh, attacking big tech. Um, you know, he's supportive of Elon Musk because he feels like um, uh, uh, liberals uh, censor um, these false narratives that, that, they, that they drive out on, on social media. So this guy is really, um, he, he's campaigning for, obviously he's on the ballot for re-election for governor. But this is all for his um, ambition to to be president. Um, the congressional maps that, that that we passed that he drew, uh, grading his own homework essentially, um, it shifted the balance of power and seats uh, from you know that the Republicans already controlled. It gave them more seats on the congressional level. They only need five to flip the uh, flip the uh, the U.S. House. 
if he can be responsible for Republicans fl- uh, flipping the House because he manipulated the maps in the state of Florida, he can tap that nation nationwide and be their champion, be their hero. So everything that he's doing, again, is all uh, uh, for his desire to be president. I'm going to be very interested to see how it all kind of plays out because of the fact we've had such an influx of people from the Northeast, Democratic people from the Northeast who have moved down to Florida. I'm going to be very interested to see how things kind of play out, not only uh, in the midterms, but, you know, as the next federal election approaches. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be interesting. And, just- and of course, I mean, we do know that the, the, the maps are being challenged um, in litigation right now, mm-hmm. um, but nothing's going to be changed before these elections in yeah. November. About 10 years ago in 2012, it took the courts uh, three years before they uh, finalized um, new maps. So we're going to be stuck with these maps for for at least uh, this election cycle. Okay. So, um, well, what what are some of the things that you're doing over there in Tallahassee? To make a difference for the for our people, not just our, I call everybody our people. Anybody live in Florida, it's our people. I don't believe in colors and race, but it does matter. You know what I mean? What are you doing? Some of the special programs around the Orlando area, and I will get to you to you. We definitely are excited to have you on you because uh, you see what jersey color that Jeremy has on <laughs> <laughs> an eagle. <laughs> hey, well, I, I um I have a, a a mobile library where I go around to uh all of uh, the Tim's of codes in my districts, because, you know, literacy is uh, something very, um, very important, especially when you talk about black and brown communities, uh, which my district is predominantly African-American. I um, mean, we know that uh, if children aren't on the uh, third grade reading level, by, um, by the third grade, then um, the state of Florida is, is projecting you to go to prison at some point in your life. Wow. So wow. we have to change that narrative. Um, I also, I mean, one of the bills that I found, like as, as a Democrat, as an outspoken Democrat, a lot of the bills I found, I didn't ne- never even get hearings because they won't even agenda my stuff to get heard. Wow. Um, but the state of Illinois is the uh, first and only state in the country uh, to have a law on the books that, se- t- that outlaws um, deception tactics used uh, during interrogation of minors. I filed that bill um, and it, it didn't get a hearing because I feel like people so so oftentimes when you talk about reforming the criminal justice system, they look at the uh, look at it from the adult perspective. And I think we need to take a step back and, and, and see what we can do to uh, reduce the number of youth that are put into the system so early Absolutely. on, right? And yeah. so when they become adults, you know, we, we won't have to deal with that issue. So I really, um, I, that's something that, uh, that is a passion of mine. Uh, a little bit about, about me that I did, I failed to mention earlier. Um, yes, I'm a first, um, first term representative of re-election this year. But prior to me running for office in 2020, I served as a legislative aide in the Florida Senate. Uh, for two state senators from this area. So I've been involved in this process. I've been immersed. I've been a student of it. And I I, I, I know the process enough to be effective uh, and to bring uh, money home. Uh, a lot of people in my district, just use, let's be honest, not just my district, um, a lot of people who are not um, engrossed in politics like I am, they can care less about what bills you pass. It's about the money that you bring home to your district. Exactly. And I know that's very important to an impoverished district like mine. So I spent the, like the, uh, the Florida Children's Initiative, which we have like five or six sites across the state. Some in Overton, um, uh, South Miami, Hillsboro, uh, Duval, and here in Paramore um, in the Orange County area. So I, I fight for funding. I've been very successful on um, getting them uh, millions of dollars. And that's a statewide initiative. So that's the Florida Children's Initiative. You should, uh, you should look that up. Um, but some other things that I that I do is is be vocal, man. Um, I think too often times, um, at least in my caucus, we spend so much time being on defense yeah. that we never get an opportunity to, uh, you know, drive drive the narrative ourselves. Um, so a, a lot of the stuff I do is is unorthodox. It goes against my own leadership um, because, and I, I just feel like we can't keep doing the same things and to, and expecting different results. Mm-hmm. And before I became elected, you know, even as an aide being in the Capitol, um, I, I saw things, I saw elected leaders and I said, man, they're not fighting hard enough. Like, what are they doing? I feel like we lay down too much, get rolled over and allow them to shove stuff down our throat. And now that I have an opportunity and I have this, uh, you know, this badge where I can swipe in and, and I, my name is on the door now. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just going to use my platform because it's no guarantee that I'll be here, that I get reelected. None of this is promised. We have term limits. So I believe you got to do what you can while you can. And now that I'm a member, I'm just going to do every day I wake up and I have, a, like I said, I have a four year old daughter. 
Um, my 87 year old grandma is one of my constituents. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of fights that I'm fighting that her generation fought that we should have inherited. So I'm going to do everything I can to make sure my four year old daughter, her generation don't, don't inherit a lot of these things that, that we're doing. State representative Travars McCurdy joining us here on the big victories podcast. And I, I mean, I think it's safe to say that, uh, obviously you're passionate. That's not, that is certainly not something that can be debated. And, uh, it's great to hear that, you know, that, that, that you feel that way that you want to continue the fight. And, and I think it's a great point that you made about being on the defensive all the time. I think that that's part of the strategy, you know, for the government to put you on the defensive. We can't hear your voice if you're constantly having to fight against what we're doing. So we can't, we can't, we don't, we don't need to let the public know what your initiatives are because you're going to be constantly battling us because of what we want to put in place. It's just, it, we're just rebutting what they say or just, you know, uh, defending that we're not driving it. We're not telling our side of the story. We're not telling what we did yeah. or what they, uh, what they blocked us from doing, you know, uh, as far as how we're trying to stand up and fight for people and tell the, tell, tell our stories. We even have a thing in the, in the Florida house where we have structured debate on these most important pressing issues. The congressional redistricting lines won't be drawn for another 10 years, another decade. And they gave us an hour and 30 minutes That's crazy. to debate on that. Yeah. Um, so they, they structure everything. They control everything. So, we have to disrupt this process. Wherever or whenever, it's Big Victory. This podcast was recorded in Miami Podcast Studios. Call us now for booking 305-968-5366 for all of your video podcasting needs. 305-968-5366. The Big Victories Podcast, hosted by Big Vic, with co-hosts Mev the Renegade and Jeremy St. Louis. Yeah. Every morning that I wake up, say a prayer and thing to make up for the chance to rise Mr. and grind another fucking day. I, I can't you keep calling him senator. I can see him being a senator, man. I can see him being the governor. Yeah, what are you talking about? That passion, but, uh, that passion yeah, and that, 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 that desire to fulfill yeah, the needs yeah, of his yeah. constituents and, and the state of Florida. I mean, I can I can definitely, definitely see that. Man, we appreciate you coming on. I want to let people know how to get in contact with you, how they can donate to you. And we definitely want to have you back on again when you get closer to find out what happened with the bill. The protests, and we all follow you very closely. You all one of the leaders. We don't consider just being in Orlando or whatever district. We, I think you're fighting for us in Florida. So, well, really appreciate it, man. Please send people the information, how to get in contact with you, because we will be bringing you back on. Most definitely. Again, thank you all. Um, you can find me on any platform, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Rep McCurdy, R-E-P-M-C-C-U-R-D-Y. Um, or just find me on the uh, my Florida House website if you want to reach out to either my district or Tallahassee office. Um, but I always make myself uh, available. I have an open door policy. If you're ever in Tallahassee visiting the Capitol, I hope that you stop by my office and see me and say hello. Um, but I, I, I really appreciate um, this opportunity, this platform. And um, I'm not sure what the green jersey, but I got a green <laughs> in my hey, That's for you, man. That's one of the best defense in ever played football. So you you got to say what's up to the, uh, to the rep, man. What's going on? How you doing? How are you, sir? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How you doing? All is well, man. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you, too. Tallahassee, huh? Hey, it's beautiful down there right about now, huh? Well, my, my home is in, in Orlando, so when we're doing our state business, I'm in Tallahassee at the Capitol. But for okay. now, I'm, I'm okay. in Orlando. I'm home this week. Okay, okay. Well, enjoy yourself. What Thank you know you, about man. Tallahassee, you? Oh, fam, you down there, ain't that? That's what ta that's what fam you is, right? Yeah, I'm a graduate. I'm yeah. a graduate of Florida A and M University. So yeah, fam you. My, my my wife went to fam you. She went there. Wonderful. Her ex wife. Yeah, she went to. Fam uh, U. Yeah, he had to throw the X in like the X. But he, when you get to Tallahassee, you gotta look up the you gotta look at the rep and check him out, man. Definitely, he's a good person to know down here. Okay, okay, that that's a bet. That's a bet. We'll pass this information along to you. All right, uh, Hugh Douglas joining us here on the Big Victories Podcast. Hugh, I worked with Donovan, so that's why I have this jersey on, because I worked with Donovan doing college football for a number of years. Okay. So I have, uh, so um, when when uh, Vic told me that you were coming on, I was like, wait a minute, Hugh Douglas? Like, Philadelphia Eagles, Hugh Douglas? He was like, yeah, man. Yeah, Hugh Douglas. Man, Donovan, Donovan is my man. We had a lot of good times, man. Donovan came in, uh, my, my first year in, in, in Philly was 98. Okay. And Doc came the next year, man, and uh, you know, he helped us reach some great heights, man. He was a hell of a quarterback, no question about it. 
And he's a hell of a guy too. He was really someone that I enjoyed working with and a guy who, you know, I mean, $100 million quarterback. And he, he comes into where I was and he was like, hey man, uh, how do I do this? How can I learn to do this? How can I get better at this? And it was actually quite surprising at how, you know, how focused he was on wanting to get better at that particular part of the craft. But Hugh, I mean, you're one of the goats, man. You're one of the greatest of all time. I mean, what have you been up to, man? What's, what's happening? What's been going on in your life? Oh no! Just working on, just working in radio, working here in Atlanta at ninety two nine the game, and uh, you know, just just running my mouth every day on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just speaking my mind, talking about football and other sports, and just you know, like I said, just just running my mouth every day. Hugh, I mean, this off season has been unbelievable. This off season with the things that are going on. I mean, the draft is the draft is tonight. Just for those of us, for those of you that are watching this, maybe afterwards, you know, he's going to be on the radio after this. If you're watching after the draft has occurred, we're taping this on the day of the NFL draft Thursday, but Hugh, I mean, I want to get your thoughts on this off season. I mean, it's been, it's been absolutely nuts. Well, you know, you know, every year with the NFL draft, there is always chaos and turmoil as far as who's going to get drafted. Nobody knows. But more so this year than any other, especially when you talk about these young quarterbacks that are coming up. You know, you talk about Malik Willis. His name has been bantered around as a potential top five draft pick. And you talk about some of the other young quarterbacks that are coming out right now, uh, Matt Corral and guys like that. You just never know. And it's it, it as far as the first overall pick is concerned, nobody knows who's, who's that going to be. Nobody knows what the Jacksonville Jaguars are going to take. And especially here in Atlanta, with them m- losing Matt Ryan, or should I say trading away Matt Ryan, mm-hmm. we don't know what we're going to do with the eighth pick. So it's all over the place right now. And and I work for I work for CBS, and so we do we've been doing a ton of draft material. One of our one of the guys I work with does our mock drafts. Ryan Wilson, he's been doing. I think he released his final mock, and he has done like thirty something mock drafts. Jesus so it's Christ. just you know he's been doing it since the first week of college football season, and he does it straight through. I think he is last. I didn't see the mock that came out today, but I think the last mock. I saw he had he had Ikima Kwanu uh, going uh, first to the Jaguars. But when you look at this offseason from an actual, I mean, we still have, granted, we don't know what, how the picks have laid out. I mean, Baker Mayfield, we still have that story. We don't know whether he's going to be dealt. Jimmy Garoppolo, mm-hmm. there's talk about him being dealt. Possibly Debo Samuel being dealt. Yeah, Debo Samuel, yes. So, so, I mean, we don't really know how things are going to play out. But just in terms of this offseason, wide receivers just getting paid like getting paid and then some how 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 have the financial dynamics of the league changed since you played i mean would you love to be playing now with the talent Uh, that you had most definitely and you talk about the guaranteed money that's being advanced around look at von miller got at 30 some years old i think it was like 30 some million guaranteed or something and the game is crazy now man and it's catered towards offensive players catered towards quarterbacks specifically, you know, that's one of the reasons why when you hear the Arizona Cardinals and Kyler Murray, they don't want to give him the money that he wants. I think he wants like 30 or $40 million a year. The unfortunate part about this is this, is that when you start giving quarterbacks that kind of money, it hinders you from doing other things as far as your team is concerned. It keeps you from getting other key players that you're going to need in free agency. One of the reasons why uh, the, the Atlanta Falcons are in the position they're in right now, we let go of Matt Ryan. We took like a 20-something million dollar cap hit. Wow. That hindered us from going out and, and, and signing a, a linebacker like Foya Lewikin, who's now with the Jacksonville Jaguars. It hinders you from signing free agents. All the free agents that we signed this year so far are on one-year deals. And we have nine draft picks, and we got to sign those guys. So when you talk about what, what, what position the Atlanta Falcons are in and trying to be competitive, they're somewhat in a pickle because they gave all that money to Matt Ryan. Yeah, that Matt Ryan contract was a fat contract that was an albatross around the, the Falcons' neck. I mean, just trying to, and of course, yeah. I, I mean, Ryan can still play. We'll see what he does with the Indianapolis Colts. I think that that's going to be a good fit for him. But I thought that it's been time for a change of scenery for a while yeah, for Matt. That but England with that contract, yeah. with that contract, though, I mean, it's yeah, hard. It's, to, it's hard to offload that. You know what I mean? Yeah. One of the things I do remember about Hugh is like I'm a Dolphin fan. Yeah, poor, uh, okay. Sorry to poor, say that. Poor, poor bastard. Poor, uh, get you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I remember when a running back I used to do some work with, he talking about there was three guys on the ego that you don't want to get hit by. So I was like, I'll, I'll say, imagine one. He said that damn 50-something. I was like, what's the, I was like, what's the rest of the number? 
I never get to see it because I'm always on the ground looking up. <laughs> hey, what's up about you? I was like, man, you caught some chaos for some quarterback during your playing time, man. Where well, that I, motivation I tried, came from? Well, that, I tried to. That that was the job. That was the job description. I I, I uh, enjoyed because I was considered a smaller defensive end. So I, I enjoyed the physical confrontation going up against the bigger guys. And, and, and you know, most defensive ends try to run around people. I tried to run through people. And, you know, unfortunately, now I'm paying for it as I get older <laughs> yeah. with, these, with these knees and these shoulders feeling the way that they feel. But that was my game. I, I, I was always told that I was too small to do this or that. So I wore that as a, as a badge of honor and a, a chip on my shoulder. And, and I would try to play everybody that I played against a little bit more physical than that to let them know that, you know, just just because I'm a little bit smaller than you, don't let, don't let that fool you. Hugh, do you think, uh, I mean, with the way that you were brought up into the game, and, you know, you mentioned the fact that you're kind of dealing with the trauma physically of having played football the way that you played. Do you think that the way the game is now, you would have still played that same way? You know, I, I, you know, it's a funny that you asked me that question because I think about that sometime because the game is so catered to uh, the, the quarterback and the offense now and it's, it's designed for the offense to score a lot of points. I don't think so. I, I don't think the game would allow you to play that way now. I mean, because, you know, get trying to get off of blocks because the ball's coming out fast, you have to be a little bit quicker. You have to be a little bit more uh, speedy to get to the to the edge. So I don't think the physical kind of play, I would do it as much. There, it would still be an aspect of the phys physicality there, but I don't think I would do it as much because it wouldn't be man, as I don't think you're telling the truth. You was the original Debo, man. No, I'm uh, telling you. Because <laughs> so, I don't know how much that fits into the game nowadays. Mm -hmm. Because... Because look at look at the the offensive linemen now compared to when when I played, they're a little bit leaner. Yeah, they're much better shape. Yes, to me, a lot quicker. And then look at the defensive linemen. You got defensive linemen now that are edge rushers that are going 240, 255 now. They're a little bit longer, but they're not as as thick. Because I, I played at about two sixty five, so it's a lot different game than the one that I played in. It's a lot more speed up the field and trying to get to the quarterback quick. Yeah, and those big guys are running like 4'7", four, 4'8". Seven, four, seven, four, yeah, yeah. Like, and you think about it now, it's a lot more, like you rarely see jumbo packages in the NFL. You see a lot of nickel packages. Yes. That are in nickel a lot more than they were when I played. So when you look at the game now, and when you look at what made you successful when you played, I mean, you played on that great Eagles team. I mean, you know, uh, Andy Reid, and I, I, I just want to know what kind of a coach, what kind of a coach was that, and what kind of an influence did he have on you? Oh, Coach Reid was a hell of a coach, man. I remember stories where when he first got there, we didn't know a whole lot about Coach Reid. We didn't know what type of coaching style he had, and we had what we used to call the first three days of hell. We we hit for the first three days of practice. Wow! But this. Kicker, the first three days, we didn't know how long we were going to hit. Wow. And I remember when, when I was in the huddle complaining about it, and I, and I said it pretty loud. I said, man, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> and Coach Reed heard me, and he told me, he said, quit your bitching. He said, don't you know you're getting better? And, and, and when he said that, I knew he had a plan. And when you look at Coach Reed's uh, teams, historically, they're always better coming out of the bye. I think his record out of the bye, the only thing he has two losses That's out insane. of the yes. bye. Yeah, in his career. So the way that he coaches, the way that he puts together a plan during the course of the season allows his teams to get stronger towards the end of the year. And 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 that really – we've really benefited for that, from that for the most part because when you look at the Eagles teams and the way that they played after that bye, I mean, we were rolling and we were fresh and we were ready to go. I know some of the people that I've been getting questioned on my DM on Instagram, they want to know who is – who are you, man? Where are you from? What are you doing? How's the family? And tell us some of the stories that growing up, like where you grew up from, man. Those are interesting. That was one reason we built the Vic Victory Podcast, to get gentlemen like you who've been to places, done things, and they can share that story with other people. And I think your life story is a big victory, man. That's the reason I had to get you on the show, and I appreciate that you accept the invitation. So tell people who you really are. Well, I'm Hugh Douglas from, from a small town called Mansfield, Ohio. It's between Columbus and Cleveland. I played for Mansfield Senior High School, Mansfield Tigers. And, uh, like, initially, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was going to go to the service when I was coming out of school. I, I was going to go to the service. And 
Khalil Ali, we, we used to call him Daddy Rawls when I was growing <laughs> up. He was a track coach. Yeah. He had me running track, and he kept telling me, he said, hey, man, listen, you have a talent. You need to go to college. He said, you need to go to college, and you need to do something. You don't, you don't need to go to the service. He said, you need to go to college. And him and a man named Stan Jefferson, who is the athletic director, he's the AD there now at my high school, helped fill out my financial papers uh, and, sent, and, 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 and had took the ACT. And ended up going to school and went to Central State and played for Coach Billy Joe and, and, and played some good football there, played against Eric Williams. I know y'all probably don't remember Eric Williams played for the Dallas Cowboys. I remember Eric Williams. I know Williams. that is. Yeah. One Big of the fella. lead offensive linemen and my frat brother, Phi Beta Sigma, that I have ever played against. And, and going against him every day, man. Eric, it's needless to say, I'm going to say it in a nice way. He used to take my lunch money every day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you don't have to say it nicely with a podcast, so say it. <laughs> yeah, he took my lunch money every day, man. And I remember, I remember going back to my dorm room, and I used to be upset about that. It, but it was nothing I could do about it. And I remember another coach of mine, Coach Lemon, kept telling me, "He said you got to go to the weight room. You got to get stronger. You you have to be, you you have to get stronger." And I remember t- telling myself when Eric left, because that was his senior year, and he went and got drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I would never let anybody do me the way that he used to do me in practice. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> you are first, man. I had so many different football guys come through this show, man. Nobody has played the others as he has been. No. Everybody uh, got this great story. Uh, they pound the people hey, down. Hey, 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 you take my lunch money. So I started working out. I would, I would be in the dorm doing push-ups and everything. Because <laughs> I, nobody else. That is never going to happen to me again. And that, that's, that's the reason why I became or I wanted to play so physical because I guess I channeled, you know, all, all the stuff he used to do to me at practice. I was trying to do somebody else. <laughs> are, you still, uh, are you still in touch with Eric? Yeah. I, I, as a matter of fact, I, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago, man. We're, we're great friends. We're great friends. And I tell, every time I tell this story about him, I always tell that story. And he can't do anything but laugh because he knows <laughs> But that's true. But that's the thing is what a great, I mean, what a great story to be a part of. I mean, yeah. he was part of the motivation that made, made Hugh Douglas, Hugh Douglas. Yeah, yeah, he knows it. He knows it. We 90 got sacks later. Yeah, we got to play against each other one time. And, uh, you know, it, it like like it's funny because we were on the field together. And this was like my sixth or seventh year in the league. And I got to play against him. And I was still a little nervous. I was making sure <laughs> <laughs> at all times. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I was a player. And he should he should be in the Hall of Fame. He was a hell of a player. I was going to ask you if you ever got the chance to go against him, and did you take his lunch money? No, no, because he was on the other side. He played. He was playing uh, left tackle. He, play, he was against the right. Yeah, tackle. I was on the right side. So yeah, yeah. You I didn't switch like, yeah, for one yeah. game. I would have switched and gone over there. <laughs> they went that way. Hey, I'm in my skills, but I wasn't that confident. Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to the Big Victories Podcast. This podcast was recorded in Miami Podcast Studios. Call us now for booking 305-968-5366 for all of your video podcasting needs. 305-968-5366. The Big Victories Podcast, hosted by Big Vic. With co-hosts, Mev the Renegade and Jeremy St. Louis. Tell me this, man. How does it feel to actually play in a stadium with 60, 70,000 people just looking down on you, cheering your name? In Philly. In Philly. Battery throw, um, the battery throwing city. You know what? I love playing in Philadelphia, man. Philadelphia is not for the faint of heart. I'll tell anybody that. You know, you, you look at the, the the situation that, that Ben Simmons was in, uh, I, I, I guess you could say Jalen Rager. Yeah, y'all, y'all eat him alive over there. <laughs> well, Donovan, Donovan. I mean, he got booed on draft day. Yeah, he got booed, man, but they love Donovan. It, like, it, it's unfortunate, but the, the situation with Donovan, it was a love-hate situation. You know, but and, – and, and if, if you're being honest, I think that Donovan probably could have handled it a little better. Yeah. Probably could have handled it a little better. And, you know, Philly's just a passionate state, man. It's just a passionate city, I should say. And they just want they just want to win. Because let me tell you, I got a chance to go to the to the parade when they had the Super Bowl. And I swear it was it was a beautiful sight. It really was, man, to see all the people that come out and and know all the stories of the fans that have been diehard fans that have had had PSLs in their families for generations. 
to see them win the Super Bowl like that and to see the people come out, it was a beautiful sight. I remember talking to Donovan about you know, losing the Super Bowl and what that experience was like. And he told me, he says, you know, like I, I literally didn't talk to people for like six weeks. Like I was just, oh, I could man. not getting to the game was one thing, but then losing that game, you know, and, and he felt not just sad for him, but he felt he let Philadelphia down these long starving fans that have been waiting and waiting and waiting and to get that close and not be able to get it you know, with something that really hurt him. And, and that's, I mean, to your point, I mean, Philadelphia, yeah, that's a tough place to play, but man, what a sports town. Yeah, no question about it. And, and, and listen, to this day, man, it's not too many too many places I have to walk into and pay for a meal. And that's been, <laughs> uh, that's been almost, what, 30 years ago. It's almost been like 30 years ago. But that's the type of town it is, man. I remember uh, uh, just being out sometimes and, and people just showing you, you, you know, love and appreciation for what you did so long ago. And, and, and that's what it's all about, man. Great place to play. Uh, misunderstood for the most part. You know, I know- Really misunderstood? Little, yeah, very- That boo Santa Claus. Yeah, fans can be a little rough, but, but you know, <laughs> you just gotta tread light. You just gotta know where- You tread lightly. <laughs> yeah, you gotta tread lightly. Well, I'll tell you something, Hugh. If they don't they don't get past the Raptors in the, uh, in the NBA playoffs here, there's gonna be some <laughs> big, big problems. Okay. I tell you, I tell you uh, Doc Rivers already catching heat. I don't know if you guys heard. The, I saw uh, his interview. That, yeah, when he was talking about, like, they were asking about his playoff failures, and he kind of, you know, <laughs> he, he kind of talked about him. it. Yeah, he kind of passed the buck a little bit. I was like, oh, Doc, no, Doc, no, no. Doc, they sound too convincing, man. Oh, uh, yeah, Doc, don't do that, Doc. <laughs> Doc, Doc, Doc. Just that fear, man. <laughs> Doc did somebody wrong in a previous life or something because his <laughs> playoff failures getting up three games is like... Well, yeah. yeah. Hey, you better get it done tonight. They play tonight, right? Yeah, yeah, they, no. yeah, they play they tonight. They play tonight, yeah. They play tonight. Oh, nobody's watching. Everybody's watching. Everybody wants to draft. I have a question for you. Coming from a small school and going to such a big city, a big market like Philadelphia, how was that transition for you playing football and, and also life itself? Well, you know, first I was in New York. I played for the Jets. So I got drafted by the Jets. So yes, that was that was that going from from Ohio to New York. That was uh, that was different because I was in New York when when Forty Second Street had naked people dancing in the windows. <laughs> like, like, seriously, a lot of people don't remember that. Like you used to go downtown in the city in, in New York, and man, listen, it all depends on what street you walk down. Ain't no telling what you, what you can get. Yeah, like, and I remember, I remember going to New York, man, and walking down the street and seeing women just dancing in the in the in the in the uh, just on the street, just in the glass, like nothing between you and her, but just a sheet of glass. And and I just remember that. I remember being in New York and being able to buy damn near anything that you wanted to buy at any time of night. Hell, I bought a sword one night at like. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You bought a what? I bought a sword. Like, <laughs> I bought a sword. Like I remember that. I bought a I bought a big like Kodan sword at like midnight in New York. And it, it was like it was weird because I was like, damn, I just can't believe I bought a sword at midnight in New York. But that was New York. And any block that you went on, like you could buy kung fu movies. Like cause when I was growing up, kung fu movies were big. So yeah. you know, VHSs and all that stuff had a huge collection of kung fu movies that I bought off the street in New York. So that was different. So so going there. From, from from New York to Philadelphia, Philadelphia felt like home to me. It felt like the Midwest. It felt like it felt like Mansfield, Ohio, more so. Mm -hmm. But the great part about it is that it, you know it all depends on where you go in the state. If I wanted to go to the city, New York was not not that far away. Mm -hmm. Or if I wanted to go to the country, you know, Lancaster was where you know the Amish people they they hung out. I can feel I can feel right at home because you know it's a large Amish community in Ohio. So it, it was it was it was perfect fit for me. It was a real perfect fit. Wow. So when you look at the chart of NFL defensive player, I'm not gonna go defensive end, and the one of the number one thing that draws you in the new age is sacks. Look by your name, how much how many sacks is there? What you say if, if what what you say? When now? they when they look at your your playing card, what what stand out to everybody is that 80-some sack, man. People don't understand how hard is it to actually sack a quarterback. Can oh, you yeah. explain yeah. that to it, them, like the, the the technique and what it takes? Well, well, not only that, like this is the thing that I don't think most people realize is that the speed of the game 
that you see on television is fast. But multiply that times 10 when you're actually out there on the field. And when you look at most, some players, like for me especially, because I had to play, I played in a two-point stance in, 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 uh, in college, mm-hmm. and I had a three-point stance, so that was a little bit of an adjustment for me. But the biggest adjustment was the speed of the game and just trying to get the game to slow down and understanding what teams are trying to do or, or, or schematically what's happening out there on the field. You know, that, that, was, that was a little tough for me. But once I got that down and everything slowed down, it became fairly easy just understanding the angle of the quarterback, just un- understanding what the offensive lineman is trying to do. Because a lot of times you see a lot of young kids now that, that rush the passer, they get that outside free and they see the quarterback and they feel like they're putting pressure on the quarterback, but the quarterback steps up. That's by design. You have to be able to collapse the pocket. And I think that a lot of kids don't really realize that because everything that the offenses do is about timing. It's about steps and things of that nature. So you have to figure out as a defender, how can you disrupt those steps or disrupt the timing of that offensive lineman trying to block you to a spot? Because that's all they're doing. They're trying to block you from one angle to the next and, and run you around the quarterback. And, and most guys don't understand that. You, you have to play a little bit more physical and try to get that offensive lineman on his heels. And if you can, push him into the quarterback. So that's where, the, that's where it becomes tough. Because, you know, you have guys that, that are speed rushers that they run up the field and they feel like they're beating their guy, but they're really not because the court, it's almost like a game of wow. peek a or whack-a-mole. <laughs> you know how the most sticks his head out? Yeah, 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 just, yeah. He pulls, he, he ducks his head back in or something like that. It's the same thing. So guys have to realize that you have to collapse the pocket when you're actually trying to rush the pass. Yeah, rushing the guy, rushing your rushing your lineman and pushing him straight back is one thing. Rushing your lineman and pushing him back into the quarterback is a completely different thing. You can rush him and push him back all game long, but you may not get anywhere near the quarterback. That's yeah. not a success. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not. It's definitely not. So, Hugh, let me ask you, who was the toughest quarterback to sack? The toughest? Uh, let me think. Uh, Dan Marino. At least Dan we got Marino. some type of win. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, Dan Marino... <laughs> Listen, I remember my, my rookie year being in Miami and and I remember being on the field with Dan and the ball came out so fast. I remember at one point I just started watching Dan Marino. <laughs> my coach was like, what the hell are you doing? What what the hell are you doing? I'm like, and I'm just watching the ball. Like, I'm just watching him drop back. <laughs> and Richard Webb was over there too. Like, Richard Webb yeah, was a big, beast. Yeah, he's a beast. Yeah, I've so been talking I'm to him, yeah. And I wasn't getting past Richmond, so I'm just sitting back, and I was like, hell, I got the best seat in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I, ain't nobody out in this game got a better seat than the one that I got. I'm right here on the field watching them do it. And I just remember being in awe of, of just the way that Dan Marino commanded the offense. Never forget that. I mean, him yelling at receivers, telling them where to go, barely calling a play, just line up and say, hey, you go here, you go here, you do this, and turn around when the damn ball's coming to catch it. Damn. And that's what it was. That's what it felt like, and I remember just sitting there watching it like, wow, like, wow, like he's a hell of a quarterback. Remember that like it was yeah. yesterday. Damn, you made me feel good, but damn, I wish we had went so oh, Well, I had the chance to also uh, get to know O.J. McDuffie, who was uh, Dan's favorite target, O.J. McDuffie, and yeah. uh, O.J. used to say that, yeah, you had to be ready. When Dan threw that ball, you had to be ready you because that ball fans. was coming. <laughs> Dan, Dan threw to a point. He yeah. didn't really – you know how some receivers come out of their break and they wait for the ball? Mm-hmm. Bap, it's like right there. And I and and that was the most to me, that was fascinating. That you would you would watch like I you would watch the ball go down the field and nobody would be in the area, and then all of a sudden the receiver would cross your face, boom, caught Jesus. caught the ball. Like he would throw it to an area. Like 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 that's what it looked like to me. It was it was the most amazing thing that I've ever seen a quarterback do. I have a two-part question for you. I know you got to go, but we can still a couple of more minutes of your time, you think? Yeah, you got. I got you. Okay. One, wh- wh- what one defensive end in the game right now would you identify that played the closest to you, the way you played? And two, who you think is the best defensive end in football right now? The best defensive end? Uh, I, I don't think any any of them. I think I... I think I was unique in the sense that that the way that I played it was a more physical game. Uh, the best defensive end in the game. Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough. One. I can tell you. I can definitely tell you who the best D lineman in the game. I think is who. Oh, uh, that's Aaron Donald. Yeah, oh, yeah, that guy is. Oh, that's Donald. I, I think because and and the reason why uh, 
I, you know what? I'll say this. I say I say TJ Watt right now. I'll go TJ yeah. Watt. I was going to ask yeah. you, but what about Watt? I will, I, will I will go TJ Watt because it's funny. I was just talking about him today. They run a 3-4 defense. We were talking about 3-4 defenses today. And I was trying to tell somebody that that's not the a traditional 3-4 that they run. Mm-hmm. TJ gets up to feel like TJ is allowed to, to get after the quarterback a little bit more. You remember back in the day when you ran a 3-4 defense, those defensive ends were two gappers. That's right. And, and, and you know, the the guys on the end, they were the, the linebackers, the outside linebackers were the ones that primarily rushed the quarterback. That's right. But, but T.J. Watt and those guys, they're allowed to, to to move around a little bit and they're allowed to widen out and get after the quarterback a little bit. So it's a little bit different. So I say T.J. Watt. T.J. Watt, what, had 22, 22 and a half sacks last year. Yeah. So, yeah, T.J. Watt. T.J. Watt. Yeah, and Aaron Donald is, I, I mean, I, one, one, of, one of the goats, I think. I think you yeah. when when it's all said and done, he's a Hall of Famer, no question. He could he could quit today and be and, and they'll be getting his bus ready in five years, no question about that. You know who I thought, but he's a smaller version of him. Who old time football, Deacon Jones. That's when I think of him. That's what I think for his passion, like, to, yeah, like mean meanness. Like, oh it, yeah, yeah. It, Deke, Deke was a mean dude, no question about that. But man, that, like it, it was like it's so many. It's so many good pass rushers, but they're just like one trick ponies. And Donald is that guy. He does it all. Tim and TJ Watt, those are probably two of the best, the best defenders, in my my opinion, in the NFL right now. So Hugh, when you when you see, I mean, obviously the college game is changing with name, image, and likeness. We've seen the transfer portal, mm-hmm. you know, go crazy this year in the offseason. Um, and and the the college game is going to start looking more like the professional game in terms of <laughs> players getting paid for their image and likeness and colleges not being able to necessarily profit just off the players without them getting something in return. So when you look at that and how things are setting up now in college, in college football and college sports, someone comes to you and says, what advice would you give me? I want to make that, I want to make it to the next, to that next level. What would you tell them? Uh, take full advantage of that NIL. If you can take advantage of that, put your money in the bank, learn how to uh, work, learn how to uh, manage your finances like right now. Because, you know, you got some kids. I, I was reading a story the other day where, where Oklahoma Sooners are offering each individual child on the football team like 50 grand for an NIL deal. Yep. $50,000. That's a nice little nest egg to start out. And I would also tell them that that football, especially nowadays, is not the end all to be all. Make sure you get your education. Make sure that you get your education because nine times out of ten, if, if you play the NIL deal right in four years, you'll come out of college with a nice little nest egg, you know. And if you get go to the NFL, that's just the added bonus. But make sure you get your education so that you always have something to bounce back on. The one thing that I love about these young kids that, that are playing football nowadays, when you look at it, you got, you got young men that are playing the NFL long enough just to get vested and they go and do something else. I noticed so that it, to the trend. Yeah, it's it's not like, you know, when I was growing up, like, you know, you had these impoverished kids that were trying to get out of the ghetto and they used to tell the, the, the feel-good stories on draft night about, oh, where well, he has to feed his family because they're living in a, you know, a, a yeah. two-bedroom apartment with eight people. It's not like that anymore. It's not like that. These kids are getting their degrees, they're educated, and they're saying, like, listen, I'm going to play football long enough to get, get my 401k yeah. and I'm this money and I'm gonna see this I'm gonna see this company that I've been thinking about my whole life. You know, and I think and I think that's wonderful because you get a chance to become an entrepreneur and your body is not as banged up as it is when you see older players playing mm-hmm. that have all these and things of that nature. So just be smart about it, man. I mean everybody has dreams of playing in the NFL, but I think if you can put yourself in a position where the NFL is just it's it's like a a plan B instead of a plan A. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great thing. I really do. One of the things I wanted to ask you too that we have on the show that we we want to go back into like what would you go back and tell you know my favorite favorite question what would you go back and ask your sixteen year old self what what would you do different if anything different what would that conversation be like you know what I mean? because I know the journey you, you you understand where I'm going with this what would you yeah, like yeah. well if. 16 year old self yes i would tell my 16 year old self to take my academics a lot more serious than you did i would definitely do that i mean but I, i've been blessed man my kids are smart as a whip and, and and you know 
uh, both of two girls are graduating from school. One one son just started at Morehouse, wow. and, and and I'm happy for them, man. And they're smart as a whip. I wish I would have taken my education a lot more serious than I did. I just wanted to play football. I was that guy, and and I wish I would have taken it a little bit more serious, just so. I can say I, I got it. You know, I don't know what I would have did with it, but I, I would have had my degree. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm 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 not complaining because I'm doing okay for myself now. But I think that in this day and age, the the, the education to have that and, and and take it a little bit more serious, I could have put myself. There's no telling how what heights I could have reached if I would have did that. We'll be right back with the Big Victories Podcast. This podcast was recorded in Miami Podcast Studios. Call us now for booking 305-968-5366 for all of your video podcasting needs. 305-968-5366. Welcome back to the Big Victory Podcast for real. NFL great Hugh Douglas joining us here on the Big Victories Podcast. Hugh, have you thought about coaching? No. Not Who said you. that quick? No, not for you. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, like I, I, I feel honestly. I feel like in my fifty years, I have honestly never worked a day in my life, and 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 I feel like when I look at coaching, I, you know, Coach Reed and, and some of my friends that gotten into coaching, they they live, eat, drink, sleep football twenty four seven. And and for me, look, you know, I get up every morning at, at four o'clock in the morning and I do radio. To me, that's not a job. That's me Passion. hanging out with a bunch of people and 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 talking talking trash, just like I'm doing now. So I have never worked. Practicing and, and, and coaching. That's work. That's a job. I look at some <laughs> of my friends that do it now. Robert Robert Mathis, he's a coach. And, and and he's coaching, man, and he's all like this guy. Is always coaching, coaching pass rush and all this other stuff. And mm-hmm. I'm looking at him, and I and I appreciate his passion. I like watching what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. But to do what he's doing? No, I'm good. I'm good. What about front not, off, never, What about front office job? Yeah, what about? They, but look, you know what I said? If I ever was a coach in the NFL, I want to be the weightlifting coach. I just want to go out there and, and lift weights and drink power shakes. <laughs> or, or be the get back coach. Get the coach and like, hey, coach, get back, get back. Make sure you stay behind. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I wanted. <laughs> I saw on Instagram because you know I do follow you. One of your daughters is actually pretty good in tennis. Can you tell us yes, a little bit about yes. that? Yes. As a matter of fact, I went to De- I went to Detroit this weekend to watch her watch her senior day. She had a match. And matter of fact, she's getting ready for uh they got tournament play this week, and she's in the GLIAC. Okay. What's okay. that? The Great Lakes Inter Inter, Inter-, Inter- Collegiate Athletic yes. Association. That whatever it is, the GLIAC. But yeah, she goes to Wayne State, man, and she's doing really well for herself. Now, I saw that. I was like, damn, there's athletes in the family. Yeah. 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 My other daughter, she played basketball, but she got burnt out. She didn't want to play. And <laughs> my happens. son, he's going to try to run track at Morehouse. I told him, I told my son, though, I was like, dude, because he, he's he's not a little guy. I said, dude, you're going to have to lose a lot of weight. <laughs> 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 Maybe you want to do shot put or something. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. I told him, he's, he, wants to be a, he wants to be a distance runner. I told him, I said, dude. Oh, yeah, he's going to lose some weight. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have to lose a lot of weight. Yeah. For- so, Hugh, uh, let's get back to this NFL season coming up. And when you look at the landscape of the NFL and how kind of teams are situated right now, some of the free agent moves that we've seen in this offseason, obviously the Dolphins have loaded up, Tyreek Hill. Uh, yeah. You know, brought him into the fold. Uh, that that AFC, I think it's the a- AFC North. Yeah. AFC East? AFC East. It's about Miami. Well, well Miami saying? and the AFC East, but that AFC North as well. Cleveland. Oh, you're talking about the, the, Pittsburgh. The Pittsburgh. Denver. Baltimore. Baltimore, you, yeah. Like that, That for me, I mean, Hugh, disagree with me. Tell me that I'm wrong, but I think there's a Super Bowl champion in that division. Hey, man, Adolphus, think- stop it. I think it's between, to be honest, and you know you got to give a nod to the Cincinnati Bengals. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're going to go out and they're going to try to bolster their defense because I think when you look at what, what they what, what they really kind of got hampered a little bit at is they, they didn't really get that much pressure on the quarterback. They played pretty good on the sec- in the secondary. Mm-hmm. Get a little more pass rush. And I think the Cleveland Browns. I think the Cleveland Browns, when you look at the way that they played last year, honestly, they were a quarterback away. 
<laughs> from, from Mason. Oh, wow. That's not his endorsement of Baker. <laughs> well, you know, honestly, I, I was a Baker Mayfield fan until last year when all of a sudden, you know, we hear that Odell Beckham Jr. is the problem yeah. and they get rid of Odell. And and then you see how they implode during the season. They had a really good defense on paper. Yeah. You know, you talk paper about champion. that defense that Cleveland had. They they really good defense. So then you look at the quarterback woes and the way that he handled that situation. I, to be honest with you guys, I don't I don't think Baker Mayfield is a starting quarterback this year. I know that there's been a lot of rumors about teams speculating and waiting for him to get cut or whatever. I don't think he's a starting quarterback this year anywhere unless it's unless it's somebody's pressed into he's pressed into duty. I don't think a team is looking at him as a starting quarterback. What do you think he might end up anyway? It's a lot of people said the Panthers. Like, I, I, was, I, think I the, heard like I heard the Panthers are, are looking at Malik Willis. The Panthers. So we'll I think tonight. I think the Panthers and Baker Mayfield will be a horrible fit. And I don't think yeah. he can beat out what you call the, the Sam guy Darnold. Who's there. I don't think he can beat out Donald. To be yeah. honest with you, I mean it, it's one of those things. I think I don't think I don't think Baker Mayfield did himself a, a favor by handling the Cleveland situation the way that he handled it. You know what Especially, he lost. You know when he lost me, um, um, Hugh. He lost me when he when he spoke on Duke Johnson contract. Yeah, and he never one of the rules I learned from football doing a business of football. A player should never comment about another player contract. Yeah, yeah. Don't talk about nobody else's money, another man's money, another man's wallet. Nah, you don't do that. And he came and back I, the following year talking about his contract. So yeah, it's like, I, I, I don't, I don't think it's it does anybody any good to talk about anybody's money. I mean, that's not that's not your place. And then, like I said, the, the way that he handled the whole thing, the way that he handled his his departure from Cleveland, you know, he put them in a position where yeah. they had they had no choice but to go out and get Deshaun Watson. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think you know he he didn't handle it. He don't he didn't handle it like I would say a guy like Matt Ryan did because you know if anybody had an opportunity, yeah, that would be for Matt. A whole fool, it was Matt Ryan because he got he got handled kind of. <laughs> it was pretty bad. <laughs> They handle him. Let me ask you this, Hugh. In terms of okay, so so we we agree that there's some good teams in that AFC North. North, yes. When you look at maybe a team that could surprise this coming season, I mean, the Denver Broncos have got Russell Wilson. The Raiders yeah. went and got Devontae Adams. You know, well, you, that's a, that West is tough. Yeah. I mean, you've got you've got the Rams that are still, you know, the Rams. So when you look at teams that could potentially surprise the Dolphins with Tyreek, I'm not going to forget about the Dolphins. Yeah, you better uh, the Dolphins. But, but when you look off. at teams that could potentially surprise in 2022, who are some of the teams that kind of come to mind? You know what? Immediately when you when you when I think the AFC is tight, there's no question about that. The AFC is tight, so I think you would probably have to look in the NFC a little bit more. And that's a, that's even a little tougher when you look around the division because you got a lot of flux, quarterbacks and stuff moving all over the place. Yeah, let me think. Like off the top in the NFC, who do I think could be a surprise? Man, that's a tough one because I'm I'm think I'm trying to think. Seattle just lost their quarterback, so I don't think that they're going to be a surprise. Mm-hmm. Well, and they're talking about you know see if Seattle goes and gets a quarterback, then that's- you know what I'm. A- I'm going to be a little bit of a homer. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go homerish here. I'm going to say the Philadelphia Eagles. Okay. I'm, I'm a, Why would you say that? Because they were a playoff team last year. Uh they're a couple uh offensive weapons away. Defense if they if they boasted that deep see like some some of the stuff that I've seen, they really like Jordan Davis up front to put with Fletcher Cox. They get somebody coming off the edge, oh, you know, Brandon, Brandon Graham is coming off a a, a, a Achilles injury, so I don't know how effective he's going to be, but I, I would say Philly because they were they were in the playoffs last year, mm-hmm. and and you look at that division as a whole, the NFC East, it's a mess over there. It's it's really a mess. The, the Dallas Cowboys imploded. We don't know what they're going to be next year. Giants, uh, Giants yeah. are horrible. Uh, Carson Wentz is coming back. I don't know. Maybe you know what? Maybe. Maybe the Washington Commanders. Maybe. Oh God, I don't think Austin Wentz is actually in the front. No, but you know what though, to, Hugh. To your point, I mean, I mean, I keep hearing about Philly possibly going after Debo. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's Debo, one of those Debo, and Jalen Rager. Yeah, and, Rager and is gone. I, I think. Yeah, he's gonna be he's gone. He's gonna they, be gone. Uh, Jalen Hurts. They're, they're gonna give. I, I think that what Howie's gonna do. They're gonna give uh, Jalen Hurts as many weapons as they possibly can. And if he doesn't get it done, they're going to get a quarterback next year. 
you you know something oh. when you bought his name up, I was thinking to be I think a lot of people basing what Debo did as this year as bait as previous three years. I mean two years. It has not been that. if he doesn't go in the right offensive system, you know what I mean? Or it's yeah. gonna be tough. He was a jack of all trades this year. He was yeah. like he was like Cordell Patterson. You know, yes. Cordell Patterson came here in Atlanta and he was a guy who did he ran the he was coming out the backfield, mm-hmm. he ran up, he was running back, and it was receiver. The thing of it is this, uh if I'm not mistaken. Debo wants to be paid like a receiver he does. because he got paid mm-hmm. and they don't want to pay. Him. No, you know, they're going to try, you know, a lot of people are speculating whether or not he's going to get traded today during the draft. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think they're going to trade him, but you know, you never know. I mean, because it's going to be, I think there's going to be a lot of moves made as far as trades today. And if that's the case, somebody might, you know, throw him in a deal or something and try to get move up or whatever. So, well, there's just, there's what eight teams that have multiple first round picks. The Giants and the Jets have picks, two picks inside the top ten, mm-hmm. I think yeah. it is. So, and then you've yeah. got the Saints in the there. Saints. I think have a couple of picks inside the top twenty. Yeah. So, I mean, there's teams. I mean, I've heard the Packers might be willing to move up. They've got a couple of picks in the first round. I think the latest mock I saw had the Packers taking two receivers to help out Aaron yeah, Rodgers. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers. I, I, I read that he's going to be instrumental. And, and what they do, so I would not be surprised with the money that they gave him. They're going to try to probably move up the up the draft and get a receiver, like a, a receiver that he has designated is the guy that he wants. Well, you have to think. I mean, if you're if you're Brian Gutenkunst at this point in time, you don't want to get into another war with Aaron Rodgers with him committing, nah. especially when they let Devontae go. Mm-hmm. You got to think yeah. you're going to Aaron and going, okay, Aaron, uh, here's the list want, of yeah. wide receivers. Who do you want? <laughs> Who do you want? And, and you're calling him with every potential move that you're going to make and asking him, is it okay if we do this? And, I would, and I would actually, when you make the pick, let Aaron make the phone call. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, let Aaron call him and say, hey. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I totally agree. With that. You know, when y'all talking about that, I remember what Jimmy Johnson said. You have two type of player. A player that could get away with it, whatever he wants. Another player, if you fall asleep, will cut your ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely, definitely. So, what do you think is going to be the surprise draft pick tonight? Who do you think is going to go up the board and another guy is going to go down the board, do you think? You know, it always happens every year in your mind. Well, I would probably say I think Malik Willis is going to go pretty high. I think he's going to probably be in the top five, you know, because – quarterbacks like you talk about facing your franchise the guy has a great smile mm-hmm. uh he, he he seems real laid back like that 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 is important as well as uh when you get when you get a quarterback it's some likability yes. i should say likability is very very important so i think he's going to go a lot higher than people anticipate him to go and you know i keep hearing trayvon walker name as a number one pick i don't think that happens i think that's a lot of smoke and mirrors yeah you know the nfl is funny that and and Every year, like I said, there's always a name that that is branched around a lot that that doesn't get drafted high, and then we always we have a Mitchell Trubisky, somebody who sneaks up the yeah. board, and everybody's looking around like, "What the hell?" So you know, and that's the one that always comes to mind because I'll never forget when the Chicago Bears called his name, how the fans what react. Shock, yeah, <laughs> they were they were, they were like, "Are you kidding me?" Who the hell is and that? <laughs> and it was a reach, yeah. So it's always that, man. It, it it's it's a beautiful thing because there's always somebody that goes in the first round that nobody predicted to go in the first round. So you, you saying going up? Sorry about that. So you saying going up is Malik and coming down is who? Is a uh, uh, Trevon Walker. Trevon Walker. Yeah. Do you do you think Malik is worth a top five pick? I think I think out of the the need for quarterback this year, yes, I think so. I think you know, listen. He has been trending upward since the Senior Bowl. Yes, and everybody talked about him. That he's been trending upward, and the fact that you know the young man has D one talent because he went to Auburn. So I, I think that nobody's questioning that. It's just that you know when you hear like it, it you, when you hear uh, weak quarterback class and things of that nature, you still got to take one. You still got to take Damn one. Right. And Maybe yeah. it's a position where you know it's a crapshoot. For every every quarterback that's taken the first round, you have very very few late round picks that are successful. So you got to you got to try to take one. Russell Wilson was a guy. Third that round, we were talking, yeah. He went to Seattle. Matt Flynn 
was slated to be the starter. He came from Green Bay. They gave him a ton of money. Yes, I remember that scenario. He he beat Matt Flynn out in training camp. So you like you just never know. Like this, that's the one position, man. It's, it's a hit or miss position, but you got to take a chance. You I'm got EJ. Remember AJ Manuel? Yeah, yeah, AJ, yeah, from Florida State. Yeah, yeah. He ain't even in the league no more. I'm I'm He's curious. Broke. I'm actually very curious to see what the Saints do because they have multiple picks. They have a needed quarterback. I mean, everybody's talking about Jameis Winston, but Jameis is as good as Jameis is. He's injury. He's coming off a major injury. He hasn't. He hasn't. He's been injured throughout parts of his career. The Saints have a needed quarterback, so I'm kind of curious. I I've thought about maybe the Saints moving up to try and get Malik, but you you know who I like in that first round? Well, I don't, maybe it's not. Maybe he's just out of the first round. It's Kenny Pickett. Who went? Who went to? Who went? Who went to Marino's alma mater, Pitt? I like. I really like Kenny Pickett. Think, Kenny Pickett could be one of those guys because we we had we were on the talk show today on my show today and we were talking about how many quarterbacks you get think you think get drafted in the first round, and I said three, and he might be that wild card. He might be that wild card, and if if he get, if he goes high, I can tell you right now that's going to throw the whole draft in a tent. Yeah, because that's three. Because you're talking about him, what Matt Corral potentially, and, and 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 Malik Willis. If those three go high, then that's gonna it's gonna be a run on quarterbacks. People are gonna panic. They're gonna start panicking for offensive linemen and tackle and defensive linemen, and it's gonna throw everything off. I'm gonna it's be gonna, yeah. I'm gonna be very curious about Matt Corral because I'm not convinced he's that it's right. not a system that made him successful. I, don't and, be surprised he end up in North Carolina in, in Carolina. <laughs> so yeah, it's gonna. On, it's going to be a run on some quarterbacks. I, I do believe that. I have. Yeah. I want to ask you a personal question about the draft, and I want to ask you, who's the top three defensive player in the draft for you? The top three? Yeah. I probably had to say, from what, from, and this is from, from what I've read, uh, I would say Sauce Gardner is one. Not, not in a particular order. Okay, the cornerback from Cincinnati. Gardner, yeah, Sauce Gardner. Okay. I was Aiden Hutchinson. And you know I got to go to the dogs. I got to go with Jordan Davis. I know he's not as high up on the list, but to me, I got a chance to see him playing every game. He's, he's a beast. A I, don't if, I don't know if he's a pass rusher because people are trying to put him in that pass rush mode. I don't know if that's him, so he might slide because of that. But he's a heck of a player, man. He the, he is one heck of a player. I want to ask you about this guy then. Um, play the same position you played, but I think he had a hands on. A, he's on a two point. Uh, the guy from Oregon, Kayvon Thibodeau. Kayvon Thibodeau. You know it's funny. He's sliding. Uh, He's sliding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, people are talking about his his uh, his commitment to the game of football. His attitude. And, yeah. You know, it was funny. I, that's who I was thinking about when I when I was thinking when I was talking about guys having other interests. I remember. <laughs> them, <laughs> he does. Re- he does represent that. Yeah, I, I remember them saying the same thing about Kevin Carter when I was coming out in the draft. Uh, yeah. Kevin Carter was not, you know, because his parents were successful. Yeah. They not committed. He was to football. And, and Kevin Carter had a hell of a career. Uh, he was a beast in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. He had a hell of a career, and 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 I, it just it it fascinates me when people use those words because I, I feel like they're, they're they're trigger words. Well, he's not committed. Why? Because he didn't come from a a, a, a bad family or a poor family, anything like that. It, it's it's he's a football player, and he was a hell of a football player. So I I don't know. I think whoever gets Kayvon Thibodeau is going to benefit tremendously. From people trying to put that on him, I don't think he's going to slide. You that think he's going to go top five though, top ten? No, he's probably in the top five. Probably won't do that. They won't be top ten. But you never know. You never know. It, like this is the thing: if those quarterbacks go quickly, then he probably won't. But if 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 they don't, then yeah, he'll probably go to top five. He's still a pass, still a hell of a pass rusher. He just gave me that Baker Mayfield feeling when I he listened to him talk like. This guy who just think he knows it. Like, I don't know what is it about him. Like, it, no, it's funny, man. It it some guys are like that, but that you know you can't just you can't you can't argue with the play on the field though. No, and yeah. and you, hopefully that that translates to the NFL level. Well, so and and I you know that the the Thibodeau situation reminds me because I was reading about you know some of the teams weren't impressed with his attitude and this and this and this and it and that that you know him being his commitment to football. I remember. I remember when I was going to journalism school and I applied for a job at an electronics 
store. <laughs> oh God! So I applied for a job in an electronics store, and I'm getting interviewed. And the guy says to me, he says, "What's your? Well, where do you see yourself in five years?" And I said, "Well, I see myself, you know, in in journalism, and yeah. you know, um, making my way through." He's like, "Oh, you don't see yourself here?" And I'm like, "No. <laughs> Why would I see myself here? I have future. I have future plans, but that doesn't yeah. mean I'm not going to be committed." If you hire that, me, that, that's the thing, and, and that's what people are trying to project because it. it I, I know it's the business of football, and, and you want to try to find the guys who want to project, and they want to be Hall of Famers. And some of, I mean, I, I, I get that. You know, we we get to talk to the uh, GM of the Atlanta Hawks every week, and he said when he's looking for young guys, he doesn't want guys that just want to get drafted. I mean, I understand that totally, but but sometimes you know, guys, you know, when they get in it. Their, their attitude changes, their, their demeanor changes. So you just he just has to get in there first. Uh, college might have been too easy for him. Yeah. And, and now it's NFL, it might it might present another challenge for him. Well, and the average NFL career is what, three, three years. four years? Three, 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 three years, years, yeah. Years. Yeah, so if you if I'm interviewing you and you tell me that you, in fi- you know, where do you see yourself in five years? Not well, here. I see myself <laughs> having graduated with a doctor's de- doctorate degree and going off and doing something else because the average NFL career is three to four years. If I get to last longer than that, I'm going to be invested. But to hold that against a guy for his commitment to football, knowing the numbers, knowing that an NFL career is so very short, I really think that's, you know, hypocritical and incredibly ironic. Yeah, that's great. why the that's why the front office be getting fired the way they do the scouts and all of them, because they a lot of them are giving personal opinions. You know, what do you yeah. think of a guy? Yeah. You, what, he just being honest. But what I, do you think? You're like, I, I mean, and I, I understand that too because you're you're making millionaires out of people, and, and you know what they say when you give people money, it makes them more of who they are. So, yeah, he's you know, a cat. He might he might you know, <laughs> he was, well you know, and, and taking a chance. And and some of the guys I work with, you know, they they say the same thing. They say, "Look, a guy can say what he wants to say, but the tape doesn't lie." That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. why I don't understand how Walker just jumped everybody when the tape was out years ago, months ago. It's like it's more like the combine. I think the combine played a little bit too much emphasis well, I, on the draft. From what I've read, it's the potential. Okay, and and the fact that he like you know. Uh, what was it? Uh, Smith, Alden Smith. He yeah. he he built like Alden Smith, and you know when Alden Smith came into the league, man, he, he was a te- yeah yeah. He was tearing shit up at the Forty ers Yeah, he was tearing it up. So yeah, that's that's what it is. Because you try to project guys. If you notice, whenever you read about draft reports, they it always say similar to this person or that person because they're trying to recreate something that they might have had in some somebody else that that had the same kind of body type. So, so yeah. So you just you just asked my next question you presented for me. Who resembled Q Douglas in the draft this year? Uh nobody. They're all taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> How tall hey, are there's you? only there's hey. only one Hugh Douglas, hey. and they're all that's all there ever will be. They're built, they're, they're built a little different. They're built a little different. They're a lot taller and leaner than I was when I was coming out. How was your draft experience? That's the personal question I wanted to ask you. I know coming from a small school. And how was that for you the night of the draft? And what was going through your mind if you can remember? You know, I, I didn't. I wasn't really thinking anything. I didn't know where I was going to go. Mm-hmm. I just know that, like, I wanted to be drafted. Didn't know where I was going. I, I thought that I might have a chance to be a Detroit Lion. You know, because I had talked to them quite a bit. I just wanted to get it over and, and figure out where I was going and get on with that next chapter in my life. So that that's what I wanted to do. And when the New York Jets called, you know, it's funny. I was a little hesitant about saying yes. I was like, ah, they said, you want to be a Jet? And I thought for a minute, I was, I wanted to say no. no. Does because anybody want to be a Jet? No, but, but I'm from the Midwest and I was like, man, I'm not, you know, going to the big city, bright lights, big city. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a little intimidating. And that was the reason, but I was like, no, I can handle that. So yeah, I said yes, but I, I just wanted the process to be over. That's all. That's the brightest lights in the biggest city right there. Yeah, it was. And, you know, when I got there, we were second-class citizens to everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah it was. And it was like the, the Islanders, the, the the Yankees. Rangers. The Mets, every, everybody else, the Knicks. And then, the, then maybe the Jets, maybe the, well, the Giants, then maybe the Jets. Yeah, it was like that. A lot going on in the city, man. It was a lot going on in the city. Where you living now, Hugh? What state? I live in Atlanta. I live in Atlanta. I live in Sandy Springs. Love it here, man. The weather's beautiful. Here in Georgia, no sand, no peaches. No, no sand, no beaches. No sand, no beaches. Yeah, yeah, I thought you know peaches. Yeah, lots of peaches, peaches there. Yeah, um, lots. 
and and Atlanta too. I mean, a great sports town as well. I mean, you know, obviously the Hawks going out kind of hurts things for them. But uh, I, I also wanted to say, Hugh, uh, I was born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, which uh-huh. now has the Atlanta Thrashers hockey franchise is now the yes. Winnipeg Jets yes. two point oh. Yes. That's my uh, that's my that's team. A Canadian See, story. I even have a tattooed on my arm. See, I have that. Uh, yeah. Don't say Drake. Don't say Drake. No, my partner John Fricky, he he complains about that all the time and he hopes and he's he's beating the table every day hoping that Atlanta gets another hockey team back one day. One really? Day. Well, they've had two yeah. already because you had the Atlanta Flames which became the Calgary Flames and then you had yeah. the Thrashers which became the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah. I just don't think, you know, it's funny, man, like, you know, being in Philly, you talk about the Flyers and, yeah. and, and hockey being down here, we don't really talk a whole lot of hockey. <laughs> no, I don't imagine. No, I don't imagine. It's football and basketball, and that's it. Maybe some baseball. Yeah, a lot of baseball. You know, we got we're excited because Ronald Acuna is coming back. Hopefully, he's going to be back in the lineup soon. So we're excited about that. Well, and Atlanta's become in the last few years too quite a soccer town with Atlanta United. Oh no, that, no, no doubt, Atlanta United, man. Uh, listen, I, I I went to a game a couple weeks ago, sold out. Uh, great crowd. Uh, uh, Unfortunate part, Joseph is hurt. We just lost Bragg was down our goalie, so it's it's a little tough for us right now. We're trying to figure out what what our identity is right now here in Atlanta United. It's amazing to hear a, a goat like Hugh Douglas talking about soccer, which is something very close to my heart, Hugh. Um, yeah, you just made his day, but, man. But uh, it's 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 but that but that says a lot about about what Atlanta United has been able to accomplish. By being, by getting into the psyche of not just you know of the of the Atlanta sports fan and to see that place packed the way that it is and the passion of those Atlanta United fans is unbelievable. So oh it's, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's really it's great beautiful. to hear that you're supporting the team, Hugh. That's awesome. Oh yeah, definitely. Five stripes. Hey, five stripes are great, man. Great, great, great soccer town. Definitely. You know, Hugh. One reason that we actually came together and built this podcast is to get 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 people like you who could come on. And actually give back, being honest with people and showing where you've been, where you're going. And it's not where you at right now. You never know what, like you said, what a future might have you. That was one of the reasons that we created a Big Victory podcast. And truly, I think your life is a big victory, man. Coming where you came from, seeing the things you see. Now, you got the attention of a lot of minority, or not just minority, kids, period. And I think what you're doing right now, being on the radio, Man, anything we can ever do for you from this podcast or anything that we have going on, man, you have been one of the best guests we ever had, the most honest guests, and so entertaining, man. I, I'm begging to get you back on, maybe even after the draft, some months after the draft or before okay. training camp. And Not a problem. This conversation has been, and as long as anything make my partner happy, man. <laughs> I'm happy, man. <laughs> no, Hugh, it's been great having you on, and uh, it's been a personal pleasure to be able to to be able to chat with you. One of the one of the all time greats in the NFL. Thanks for joining us here on the Big Victories Pod. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate you. Appreciate. Man, you. Thank you a lot, Lou. Not Cheers, a you. Not- Cheers, right, you. Not- Have a good one. You too. Push talk, big buddy, Bema. Y'all them love me one finna me like then a big bulldog Four four air trigger And the boy this will get them egg top Lift up in the push start Big body Bimma Y'all them love me one finna me like then a big bulldog Four four air trigger And the boy this will get them egg top Lift up in the